Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, maybe it's time for us to shake up uh, a little bit. I was just reflecting and thinking that after delicious meals, we perhaps may expect more prayers in the afternoon. But uh, maybe we need to shake up and perhaps just to repeat this theme here, uh, just once, um, everybody together, shape up. Just to repeat the theme, shape up together. You know, I, I just like the theme. And um, anyway, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Omrao, our dean, for giving me the privilege to introduce our speaker today um, for this hour. Our speaker uh, comes to us, a uh, resident in IAS, a graduate institution, but he comes all the way from Costa Rica. And uh, he is a minister of the gospel. He has pastored before uh, in Chile, in Costa Rica, in uh, Guatemala. So he is an experienced uh, minister of the gospel, as it were. And he holds, obviously, a Bachelor of Theology degree um, that he attained in 1980. And maybe some of us were not born yet and not imagined would be born then. And uh, he holds a Master's um, of Ministry as well as an MA in Religion and Sciences. And terminal degree um, is a Doctor of Theology uh, as well that he attained in two 006. And before I tell you about um, his focus for his dissertation, allow me to also say that he's married to one wife, and he has um, two powerful sons and one um, beautiful daughter. And so we were just talking just before I came up front here, and his son is 20 years. And looking in the pews, I think there is good candidature for him. Um, he's a Bible scholar, actually, in his own right, taking after the Father, uh, as it were. And um, he has touched the lives of so many people. And he told me a little story just now that when he was leaving one of his places of labor in Guatemala, People came to him, elders, young people, and said, Pastor, we're going to miss you. We're really going to miss you. And so he says, I thought they were going to do good. I said, what is it about? And he expected them to say, your great sermons, your preaching, your visitations, your what have you. And then they said, no, yes, yes, but we're going to miss your humor. And uh, let me tell you, uh, he's, we're also privileged uh, with um, a, a brother, Genabago, here. He's our professor in seminary. Uh, Dr. Mora is, is a humorous man. You don't feel like, you know, even when things are tense, he has a way of cooling them down, and you just feel good, accommodated, and elevated to the levels that you expected to be. His dissertation, without much ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it was on glorious land, and one glorious mountain in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 8, verses 9, and uh, chapter 11, verses 16, and verses 41 to 45. Actually, I've paraphrased it. Um, it's, it's much longer, the title, as it were. We are happy, privileged to have him speak to us, particularly as we go through our theological pastoral formation, and we upload the dean and his team for organizing such a powerful meeting. And without much ado, we'll invite uh, Professor Mora to talk to us. Let's put our hands together as he comes up front. Thank you, Pastor Huiso. Pastor Huiso is a student from a pastor in Zimbabwe. And Pastor Huiso forget to say something about me, maybe the most important issue. I am just a sinner saved by grace. Everything else is just an accident in this life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you.
for being with us and guide us in this study, very important study on the book of Daniel. Give us your Holy Spirit and help us with uh, your light. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Daniel, and as Pastor Wieso mentioned before, uh, when I started to look for my topic in my dissertation, I said, I will study Daniel 11. And a friend who is a pastor also, he got his PhD also, and he told me in Spanish, Usted se está metiendo entre las patas de los caballos. It means you are getting inside the legs of the horses. Because this is a very hard topic. But I start to work with Daniel 11. I have written articles and one book on this. And now I love Daniel 11. This is an amazing prophecy for every one of us. And my focus, as he said, is verse 41, glorious land, and verse 45. Then what we'll see here is some issues connected with uh, my dissertation, but it's also uh, connected about the remnant, ecclesiology, the church of God. And Daniel, this section, Daniel 11, Verses 40 to 41 is the locus classicus of the eschatology in the Old Testament. For me, my friends, this is the best and ultimate passage in the Old Testament about eschatology. Daniel verse 11, chapter 11, verses 4, 40 to chapter 12, verse 3. There's no any other passage in the Old Testament about the last events like this session in the Old Testament. Um, here, it presents the most detailed records of the final events in the Hebrew Bible. It is a key prophecy for the elaboration of the eschatolic, eschatological background. But why Daniel verses 40 to 45? Well, you know, when you are doing uh, exegesis, one of the steps on the exegesis is you should limit your passage. Eh? It's, it means you should say, my paragraph starts here and ends in this section. We have here a special section in the Bible, in Daniel 11. First, the previous section, Daniel 11, the verses 36 to 39, actually there was a student one, two years ago who wrote a dissertation on this section, Pastor Edwin Payet. Uh, this section is an independent paragraph and talks about the blasphemy attack of the vile person, that one who pretend to be God. It means after verse 39, we are starting a new section. Second, the phrase, at, at the end of the time, points out the beginning of a new paragraph, and it is connected with the eschatological days. We have a, this special expression at the beginning. Later, we will check this expression. Number three, in this session, reappears the king of the north. We have, again, with this expression, the king of the north, the last mention is in verse 15. After that, disappear this expression. Now we have again, in another total, a total different context, we have the king of the north. And 
finally the culmination of the final drama when the, this king of the north will come to this end and no one will help him. This is the last expression in verse 45. Then it means that this section is a, is a, is a paragraph. It's what we can call a pericope. When we have a special section, and finally, <clears throat> next chapter is the sequence of this element. Remember the chapters uh, didn't exist in the original scrolls. This was an addition in the 12th century. Uh, then the next, the story don't, doesn't finish in verse 45. Verses 1 to 3, chapter 12, is the end of all this section. Then, uh, with these ideas, we could say that our work is verses 40 to 45. And then, let's see. Here, and a structure. And this is the text, as you can find in, in the Bible. Notice uh, that there are some elements to divide it in this section. The first, if you check, we have here at the end of the time. I don't have chance here to review this idea. But in Daniel 11, when I was studying this chapter carefully, I found out that there are many expressions about time. In those days, at the end of the time, at the end of this, at the, at the end of these days, there are 11 mentions of time, as well as there are 11 or 13 mentions men, uh, talking about defeat. Well, chapter Daniel 11 is full of wars, kingdom, kings fighting uh, to each other, and then, obviously, <clears throat> there will be defeats. But we, I, I, this cuts my attention. Many mention of days and times, uh, the, this topic, and also the mention of defeat. And then it's very interesting that we have here at the beginning time, the scatological time, the end of the time, and then defeat. Uh, later, I have found out that the king of the south will collude him with him. The south defies the power of the king of the north. And then I put here, but rumors of, uh, from east and north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great. You see, and there is a B, and oh, sorry, here, B with B2, the south, and here in B2, verses 42 and 43, it's talking about Egypt. Then I say, again, here there is a connection between these two elements. And you see there is A, B, C, D, E, and the core center of the passage is here, E. The glorious land, Palestine, and Transjordan, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. And then, what uh, is very interesting that here is Noah totally and I should be honest with the text. I won't, I won't force a chiastic structure. The text, at least in my story, didn't allow me. You see that finally you have D, B2, and C2. It seems that uh, it's broken, but it, it's exchanged here. Here's the south, and C is talking about a massive attack, and here again, a massive attack. Uh, then I should put in this position because this is what the text is suggesting. What ideas we can find in this structure? First, the glorious land, the topic of my dissertation. Here, the beautiful land, the precious land, the wonderful land plays an important role in both sessions. In 1116, and I didn't bring the section of 11.16 when you have again the same expression, glorious land, and it's in the core of the structure. The same idea is remarkable about the holy glorious mountain. You have, you have here, verse 45, and the beautiful holy mountain is another other expression in this text. These two places are always the object, object of the attack 
of the papacy, of the king of the north. This reminds us, chapter 8, where the little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. Daniel 8, verse 9. Second, you see that the structure is not a complete symmetric chiasm. Because the units do not allow that kind of structure. The sections, as we say already, B and C, these two sections are inverted. In his first attack, the king of the north conquers Palestine. Here, you have here uh, the first attack, a massive attack, and conquers Palestine, and uh, Transjordan. Later, we will see a map. Remember, uh, the Bible is written uh, in the context of, of Palestine. And then if you want to understand the prophecy, you want to understand the, the scriptures, you should read history and you should learn geography in order to understand the prophecy. And we will see that ge the geography is very, very important here in chapter 11. So uh, in the second battle, his second attack here, you see the first attack. In his second attack, uh, from the uh, he is already in Egypt and he's controlling the country verse 43 and now his army should come back and go to Palestine we will emphasize here he is here in verse 43 he conquered Egypt the king of the south but in same moment there is rumors from the east and then he should go back and we will emphasize this later he should go back, this king of the north, to control this power. Then, that is the reason that the attack is point to that point, uh, Cardinal Paul. Let's see, my friends, uh, Let's see here now a, a, a diagram, maybe in a more dynamic way. You have here provocation of the king of the south. This, the verse starts saying, at the end of the time, there is a rebellion. If you read the previous chapter, you will see that the king of the north was controlling the king of the south. In verse 40, 45, say that he subdued the king of the south. And they tried to sit together, but she wanted to sit uh, to the other one. And uh, this is the... But now we have here a rebellion. The king of the south attacked the king of the north. And then the king of the north reacts. And when he reacts, the Bible says at the end of verse 40 that he sent his armies with rage and he attack but if you check and later we will check that if you are in the north and you go to want to go to Egypt you should walk through Palestine Palestine was the bridge between Egypt and Mesopotamia in those days in the ancient days and then he attack and this attack I have found two attacks Number one here against the beautiful land, and number two against uh, many countries, Moab, Eden, and Ammon, the Transjordan countries. And then after this, when he subdued Palestine, he attacked Egypt. Remember, the attack came from Egypt. Now he attacked Egypt. Uh, by the way, <clears throat> when my friends, when we are talking in the Bible about uh, cardinal points, remember that they always wrote with the idea of Palestine at the center of the earth. And then we should refer to then north is Syria and south is Egypt, according to the geographical positions. Then he controlled not only Egypt, it is the, the, his second attack, but also Libya and Ethiopia. 
follow this power. But suddenly, when it seems that he is control everything, there is some reports from the east and the north that will alarm him. And then this king, when he thinks that he control everything, there is some news. And this king starts to shake and he gathers again his armies and he goes back to this point and then he listened to his, uh, he heard this news and what happened then he will set up in a great rage against this power he go back and then we reach the climax the final battle he pitched his tents between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain but suddenly he will come to his end. Notice, uh, we can say many, hear many things. The attack of the king of the south, the reaction of the king of the north. Then later, the second element is that the attack against the south was made in two stages. First attack to the lands and second attack to the land, to Egypt. Um, and finally, this fact has an important eschatological implication, as we will see later. Now there is a new provocation, not by the South, that, he's, that he has been already defeated, but this time from the news that come from the North. Then the finally military move is against the origin of the rumor, the holy, glorious mountain. This is the only place that no accept the, the control of this blasphemous king. This is the, there is a flood of idolatry around the world. The world is flooded but by this power and by the blasphemous actions. But there is only a little peak, a little island that still stands by for his God. And this little peak among all the world at the end of the time will defeat, will de defy this power. And then we have the last eschatological events. We have no time to go deep with every detail. Let's just say that there is a broad consensus between Adventist scholars that Daniel 11, 40 to 45 should be understood in eschatological background. In this section in Daniel, there's no problem among the, the Adventist scholars. All of them agree. Dukan, Shay, Uriah Smith, whatever you read, they will agree in this section. There is a section that is a big issue. In Daniel 11, it's verses 21 to 28. Maybe someday you can write a dissertation on this section of Daniel 11. It's a, a very interesting section. There are many discussions. Scholars uh, those don't agree on, on this section. But all around, everyone agrees that here, verses 40 to 41, is related with the element to the uh, eschatological events. Why? Because here, when they say at the time of the end, they are using a special Hebrew word, ketz. Ketz is very important. This expression literally means end, limit, <coughs> border. Theologically, the word offers appears in the context of divine judgment. Elsewhere, Daniel used ketz to signify the eschaton, the end time of the human history. Then when we reach this point, we're talking about the end of the time. In some cases, uh, this word can mean in Daniel the end at the time, uh, at the end of the years, like in verse 6, chapter 11. But here we're talking about the eschatological events. 
then the question is, and my friends, Seventh-day Adventists, when did the end of the time start? When? Well, this is another issue we can uh, we will can take here time, but you know already, my friends, when the time of the end st started, seventeen ninety eight, and you can read this in Daniel chapter twelve, verses six and seven, when they say, "When is will be the when is the the end of these things?" and he alludes to the, time, the prophecy of times, times, and a half time. What happened in those days? In the light of the historicist interpretation, in these passages, the northern king represents the political and religious power of the papacy. Why the north? A brief, a brief explanation. North in the Bible represents the cardinal point of God. God came, comes always from the north. And you can read uh, Psalms 48, verse 1 to 3. Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. You can read uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 10. The north is the cardinal point from God. But here, there is a false king of the north who pretends to be like God. And you, read, you can read that in verses 36 to 39 in Daniel 11. Then this power, this kingdom, during the Middle Ages, the papacy was formed by the union of the civil and religious power. But it would be confronted over time by the king of the south. Finally, the secularism, the political powers revealed against this power about the papacy. And then they will be attack, they would be free. The South or Egypt in the scriptures represent the atheistic attitude and ignorance of God. Remember, and this is the idea we follow, that the Pharaoh said to Moses, who is God? Exodus chapter 5, verse 2. I don't know that God. I don't believe in that God. This atheist way to be is the way that finally they are uh, rejected, which manifested itself in the position of atheistic and anti-religious enlightenment, which found its high expression in the French Revolution and later in the 1917 in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. The revolt in France in the late 18th century, along with the establishment of the American Republic in 1776, are regarded as the beginning of an era of unprecedented religious freedom in the history of, the, of mankind. It has been promoted in countries around the world, especially in the Western world. This is the commonly known as the separation of church and state. The prophecy states that at the end of the time, the time of the 1,260 years prophecy. This reaction would give the king of the south the chance to rebel against the oppression of the north. This time prophecy found its fulfillment in 1978, which marks the beginning of the end of the time. Then you see there is a reaction. History show that the south reveals again the control of the church, reveal again the control of the papacy, and later the papacy received this wound of in, on his head according to Revelation 13. Then in that situation, and we can, we can say that we are living in verse 40 today, and we're expecting the last events in verse 41 and so on. We can see a consistent in a progressive leadership um, <clears throat> in the movement of the northern king 
in his race for glow and dominance. Notice the sequence, the northern king is challenged by the king of the south. As a result, the king of the north mobilized his armies to counter the threat. And finally, his attack takes a north-south orientation, which means, in geographical terms, progress through Palestine, the glorious land, the natural bridge in the ancient war from Mesopotamia and Egypt. It's in this moment that the, this king reacts. And then, when we reach this, the question is, what is the glorious land? Is it necessary at this point to identify the glorious land? Adventist researchers have proposed several options. In 1145, Price suggests a symbolic interpretation and believes it could be the Protestant world as a whole. Although it's not entirely covered in details and explanations, Araceli Melo says this applies to 1116, but in 41, it is considered literal Palestine in the days of the Turkish Empire, and we don't agree with this position. It is evident from the historical reality of the 20th century that Palestine cannot be present like at the time proposed by Melo because of the universal eschatological symbols and rejection <coughs> of the Jewish nation as chosen people. Meanwhile, the Hill proposed that in tearing the glorious land of beautiful land is a symbol of God's people and evolves and full blown persecution against God's people beginning at time of distress. As noted above, the glorious land was not the prim primary objective of the king of the north. The challenge came not from the glorious land, the challenge came from the south, from Egypt and goes beyond its strength. But before subjecting the south, the king of the north needs to conquer Palestine in order to retake the lost medieval hege 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 hegemony. The papal power should subdue the revolt for, of secularism. For reaching this goal, the attack of the north has previous and fortunate stop in his attack to the south, the glorious land. Then what is the glorious land? Remember, my friends, when we are going to interpret, we should go to the Bible. The glorious land is a reference to Palestine. The Old Testament passages depict a unique and beauty, a unique, a unique beauty in Palestine. And it's very interesting, my friends. Daniel and his two contemporaries, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, are the only ones who use this expression, glorious land. And when they use this expression, they are referring to Palestine. Then for reaching this goal, God's people were there in Palestine in those days, and his dwell in the temple was there too, from where justice was taught. This unique title is used only in the Old Testament in the days before the exile, Jeremiah, and during the exile itself, Ezekiel and Daniel. So, yes, in that his appearance is given in the context of tribulation and loss. Very interesting. Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah mention this expression in the context of persecution, of stress. These prophets use the term specifically in connection with Exodus from Egypt at the sojourn in the wilderness, the Babylonian captivity, and in Daniel 8, 9, and 11, 16, the Roman subjugation, when land ceased against to belong to Israel. This is what happens at 1141. It's an environment of crisis. The glorious land is, ag is again invaded, and many countries shall be overthrown. Then for the evidence would indicate that glorious land is the one with which God has given a special attention. But if you go to Israel, especially in those days, uh, and today, 
If you visit Israel today, you realize that Israel is no, honestly, it's not a beautiful country. Only the, the, the north in, in the Sea of Galilee is very nice, it's green. There are many very nice uh, sections, forests. But the south is dry, is wilderness, only rocks, sands, and the wet. The weather is very warm. It's not a very good country. In those days, Palestine doesn't have any beauty. It's when it's not, it was not a center of power. The center of power was Egypt or Mesopotamia. There were no mines of gold, of silver. Then why Palestine was it's called the beautiful land, the rich land? Do you know why? Because God's people and his temple was there. And that's the reason that it was called the glorious land. In, a, in a spiritual aspects, its war is a strategic. Then in the last days, in our days, the glorious land points out God's people in this militant phase, which proclaims the word of God and his teaching that were rescued by the Protestant reform and withdraw the freedom of conscience and of thinking. The remnant of God's people will be placed in an injunction for they proclaim a message of condemnation and invitation to the entire world to worship the Creator. Then the beautiful land represents God's people in the last days. The religious system centered upon the Bishop of Rome before doing the frontal attack against the secular war and showing the true intentions of its government and should enter and subjugate the church of God to his control and hide the principles which they proclaim. What, is, what we are suggesting here is that this is the moment where they start the persecution and get the churches. If the papacy want to control this war, he should, they should start controlling the different churches they attack God's people, but also the prophets say that some provinces in that area also escape. They will escape. What provinces? Edom, Moab, and Ammon. And if you go to the Bible and you check these three powers, who were Edom, sorry, Edom, Ammon, and Moab? Edom was the brother of Israel, Esau. Ammon and Moab were the children of the of Lot, cousin of Israel. It means they were relatives. They have some blood connection among them. But always, when you read the Old Testament, you realize that always these peoples, the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Ammonites, were fighting against God's people. Then that's the reason that <clears throat> usually the common interpretation, a more logical interpretation, is to say that these peoples represent the Christian movements who are connected with God's people, who are connected with the truth, but that in some moment they have refused the whole truth. They have in some way persecuted God's people. And that's the reason that they attack God's people. That is in, uh, during the final events, these Christian movements who once had contact with the divine revelation will escape. However, they manifested an openly apathy disguised against it. Some scholars discuss, well, when they say that they will fall or they will escape, some say that they join the, the Christian church in this persecution. Or they say, no, that they will escape because they subdue to the king of the north. Personally, I, for some arguments, I prefer to, I, I accept the idea that is the idea that these peoples represent the Christian churches, no Adventists, no the remnant church, but they should uh, submit themselves to the papacy. 
That is, that they are free. They will be free because they will follow this power. Then, the, after the submission of these people to the Transjordan, it means of the other side of the Jordan River, then came the attack against Egypt. What is Egypt? Verse 45. What represents Egypt in the, in the uh, prophecy? Well, here we have talked about this. After the papacy obtained the dominion of the religious power, he attacks the economy and the secularism. It means he will attack Egypt. Egypt represents the world, the secularism. Egypt is always a symbol in the Bible, the place where is the world. And then, in this case, the papacy finally will attack and we can confirm this with the uh, spirit of prophecy. The papacy will attack these political powers. They will submit these powers. And the Bible said that also Libya and Ethiopia will follow these powers. It has been proposed that the reference of Libya and Ethiopia western and southern borders of Egypt anticipates a total submission of the later kingdom of the Egyptians, both Ethiopians and Libyans and Egyptians descended from Ham, son of Noah, suggesting so a family relationship as indicated in 1141 and again between three neighboring countries. In verse 41, Ammon, Edom, and Moab. Here in verse 43, Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. Ethiopia was a great nation that often fought with Israel in the days of the Old Testament. The prophets announced the doom of, the, of Ethiopia. On the other hand, the reference of Libya is mentioned in connection with Egypt and their struggle against God and, or against Babylon and in alliance with Gog and Magog, enemies of God. These kingdoms, Libya and Ethiopia, were always subjugated by Egypt, but they had the chance to take power of the pharaohs and for their own dynasties. These evidences suggest that Ethiopian and Libyans represent those pagan kingdoms and peoples who have been alien to the biblical faith and move in an environment that rejects the Lord as represented by Egypt in the prophecy. Does mean the EG represent the secularism, the whole world? Libya and Ethiopia represent especially those hidden peoples today, no Christian countries that also will subdue themselves to the power of the papacy. Finally, when it seems that the victory is complete, that they have the control of all the world. What happened? But reports from the east and the north will alarm him. When it seems that he is in victory, he has a war control, he hears some rumors from the north. Remember, what is the cardinal point of God? North. And the east, what is the other cardinal point of God? The east. Remember in Revelation 16, the prophet says that the kings of the east, they came from the east. East and north at the point of God. And then, this news shakes the victorious king of the north in his moment of triumph. These are the good news of the coming kingdom of God and the fall of Babylon. Immediately, this wicked monarch launched his army into the glorious holy land. We understand this as the fulfillment of the prophecy of Revelation chapter 18, when the Bible says that the last call, the last invitation to the world, Babylon has failed. Come. 
come out from Babylon. And then when, as, and Ellen White also mentioned this, that when the papacy realized that there are some people still preaching, saying that they are failing, then the papacy will attack. And this is what we have here. He will set out in great rage. This is the last proclamation of Revelation 18.4. And this is the last battle, the final effort in order to demand the entire world. Let's see, my friends, here, uh, the uh, geographical idea of this passage. Notice, the king of the south, Egypt, and the king of the north. In those days, especially in verses 5 to 15, Before the cross, and for me the cross is in verse 20, the birth of Jesus Christ. Other people say that it's 22, the priest of the covenant. But I agree with Dukan that this is not Jesus. William Shade and others support the idea that the priest of the covenant is Jesus. I don't agree with that position. But well, this is another uh, topic here. But the main issue here is that in those days, Palestine was here, Syria. During previous Jesus days, the Seleucids was here, the descendants of Seleuc, the general of Alexander the Great, and here the Ptolemaics, the descendants of uh, Ptolemaeus, the general of Ptolemy, the, the general of Alexander the Great. They founded two dynasties and they were always fighting one in the south and one in the north. But here you have the last days, and the prophecy says that then the king of the south will attack, will rebel against the, the north. And what happened? Then the north came through Palestine. Remember the first attack against the lands. They controlled Palestine here. They controlled God's people here. But also in this section, the Transjordan, the Edomites at the south, Moabites, and, and here at the north, the Ammonites. And then after that, they attack the king of the north, the south. And then when they attack the south, what happened? They conquered the land and they take control of the king of the south. And now it seems that they have the total control. But suddenly, there was news. I noticed very interesting. The Bible says from the north and the east. North is here and the east is here. It means northeast. And if you go to the northeast from Egypt, you are going where? To Palestine. And here in the Palestine, there is a small place. Verse 45. The holy glorious mountain that is the only place that is preaching it seems that the rumors of the north came from here from the holy glorious mountain and that the reason what he did in verse 45 the bible says that the, the king of the north came and pitched his tents pitches his tents between the holy glorious mountain and the sea The Mediterranean Sea. And what is the meaning of the waters in the prophecy? Peoples, multitudes, nations. It means the papacy in the last days, when God's people is given the last call, he will pitch his tents in order that the people, all those who have been deceived, cannot be cannot listen to the message of salvation that is coming from the church. Then what is the meaning? You see the attack? He avoid that the, these people listen to this prophecy. What is the meaning of the holy glorious mountain? And I will finish with this, my friends. Don't worry. I'm almost done. Well, this is a long topic in the Old Testament. Again, my friends, if you want to study something, you go always to the Bible. Remember our principle of interpretation. 
the Bible is its own interpreter. And we always interpret no what we think. Some scholar says, no, the north is Russia. No, the south is Zimbabwe. No, my friends, we should go to the Bible and hear the mountain. What is the mountain? Well, the mountain is a place for the manifestation of the divine theophany. Zion with the temple as the divine abode of God. Also Zion. Finally, Zion took this idea. Very interesting. When you go in the theology of the, of the mountain in the Old Testament, first, God was manifested in Mount Sinai. But when God created, when Moses built the tabernacle, the presence of the Mount Sinai, on God from the Mount Sinai came into the tabernacle. And from there was moving in the tabernacle. Finally, the tabernacle was settled in the mount, on the tem uh, temple mount. You know, my friend. But Mo is, this is not Mount Zion. Mount Zion is in the other place. But finally, they took the whole the name for the, as the Mount Zion. A reference also to the mountain, to the heavenly throne of God. And in the eschatological perspective, in a connection with the place where the nations gather to the final battle, remember Joel chapter 3, they are called to the valley of Josaphat. And in the mount of Zion is God's people, and God is with his people in that place, the place of the judgment, and where a judgment is made against nations, and the site where the remnant of the people of God meets. These elements, all these elements, is a short summary of the theology of the mountain in the Old Testament. These elements give the background for interpreting the glorious holy mountain of Daniel 11.45. First, the context indicates the gathering of the nations as in Joel 3, in a final battle against God and his mountain. mountain. And this is where Michael released his people. There is also remnant of God that has not been under the control of the global alliance. Moreover, in the culmination of the great controversy between good and evil in this world, this war takes cosmic proportions. It is more than a simple war with early results. The glorious holy mountain is the satanic ambition of sitting on the sides of the north, but here in the context in an early one during the final events of human history, his aspiration is to reign in the whole world and take the place of God. For this reason, the glorious holy mountain cannot be defined in one phase, but at least in this section, in this paragraph, the mount of the congregations in Daniel 11 represents, yes, the remnant, the glorious land represents the remnant in this militant phase. But now, the holy glorious mountains represent the remnant, but in his victorious face, the final church in the last days. In the last invitation of salvation and of gathering in the holy mountain, this good news is a challenge for all these peoples. God is calling his purpose is to prevent this message of Satan to reach the seas. And finally, when he attacked, as Ellen G. was present, and later, chapter 12, when the papacy is ready to destroy God's people, is the last events. Michael will rise and he will fight for his people, and he will deliver. His people, and then we have the eschatological resurrection, and God's people is delivered. And verse 45 finished with the words, and there's no help for him. Finally, the papacy is left alone. So, in the context of the book of Daniel, the terms the glorious land and the holy glorious mountain have a key connotation in the interpretation of the prophecy. In Daniel 41, this address is within an eschatological context and points to God's people in the final days, in their militant phase. As counterpart in this ambience of the final events, the, the expression, the glorious holy mountain, is understood 
as the church of God in her triumphant phase. Still, this term in the light of the Old Testament theology is broader and has other phases and that are applicable to Daniel 11.45. By the way, only for mention in Revelation chapter 14, when it's talking about the 1,144,000, it says that they are standing where? On the Mount Zion, the same image that Daniel 11. This perspective enriches the scatholic content of this expression. The glorious holy mountain, the church triumphant, is the place where the remnant congregates and where Christ reigns defiant against the evil confederations caused by the false king of the north. Christ will intervene on behalf of his people and condemn the nations of the world which have gathered to fight against the land and his people. It will be defined in this final phase as the controversy between Jesus and Satan on this planet. Thank you.